Yeah, so welcome back. This is the fourth uh, lecture. Uh, today we're going to finish up what I call macro search and matching. So search and matching applied to macroeconomic contexts. And for the rest of the course, after that, we'll be look, looking at micro matching, micro search and matching. So the models will be very micro based and micro founded. <clears throat> but you should be aware there's a whole literature that takes the the Bortons and Pizzeridis model, or sometimes it's called the DMP, to include diamond, um, and implants that in, into a macro uh, model as the labor market, so it generates natural, um, a natural rate of unemployment or an equilibrium rate of unemployment. It, give, it delivers mechanisms that would be amenable to a Phillips curve, for example, create wage pressure and things like that. Um, the references are, are numerous. I think I gave one. I'll give one at the end of the lecture, but. Um, Trigari has, has done a lot of work in this with um, Mark Gertler and other people have, have followed suit. So you can even put it in a new Keynesian model. So you have sticky prices. And, uh, but I won't be doing that in this course. I'll, I'll stop here. I, even I've written a paper uh, using uh, the MP model, embedding it into a real business cycle model. So it's, it's possible to do all sorts of interesting macro things. But this is really the last macro um, course, or less class in, in the macro perspective. And from then on, <clears throat> and we'll do, we'll be spending a lot of time thinking about the microeconomics of search and, and, um, and the, the search process. Okay, so we'll review last lecture, and we'll, um, again, to fix ideas, we'll, we'll reinforce the stripped down bare bones model of Mortensen and Pissarides, and Look at that diagrammatic exposition again. We didn't. We were going pretty quickly last time. I'll refer to the um, Hart's reforms as a way of thinking about this. So, so the Hart's reforms were in 2003 to 2005. It's a long time ago, but it's kind of accompanied Germany for the past 10, um, 15 years, even longer, um, and basically has been a subject of quite a bit of discussion. And I think you can use the MP model to think about the Hart's reforms and how they worked. Uh, whether or not you like them or not, um, it's, it's, uh, it seems to be an interesting way of, of going about uh, learning how to use the MP model. So you can think about the, the changes in the model as, as reflecting things that were changed in the years 2003 to 2005 in Germany and pretty much maps into the outcomes that we see. Um, and then I'll take the 1999 version of Mortens and Pissarides, which is a, a, a really sort of what we call bells and whistles version. So there are lots of like bells and whistles, lots of additional features that are really um, interesting, but not amenable to analysis using classical supply and demand. That's what I'm trying to emphasize why this MP model is so exciting is that it actually allows us to, to add a bunch of things that we've, we just kind of didn't want to talk about or couldn't really put our hands on because uh, classic Marsh Haley and supply and demand analysis just doesn't work very well. And then I'll finish with a critique. Um, as always, one has to understand why models are never perfect, and we need we need to think about uh, the next the next step, you know, the next phase. Okay, so there are two things that are again common with the um, Pizzeridis model. Um, the first is the matching function. Firms are brought together um, as a result of two-sided search. This is like a, think of this as like a, a reduced form of the matching process we'll discuss for the rest of the course, which is a, it's, it's a way of measuring the way workers and firms are brought together in a, in a, in a job market without much to say about the process of rejection or the process of match whether you really fit. So you could apply for a job um, at a hairdresser, but if you've never done a, an, a trainee program, you probably won't do a very good job and you probably won't get the job. So that's, that's not in, in this model. This model is kind of assuming everyone's the same, we come together randomly, and then just on the basis of that randomness, unemployment arises. And we can get gross flows and we can get lots of unemployment and still have people finding jobs you know, it's a it's a fascinating thing. It isn't true every time. Every time unemployment uh, rises, the outflow out of unemployment rises. It's just a fact. 
So the, the rates don't work uh, the way we'd like them to. In other words, the rate of, the rate of matching holding vacancies constant for the unemployed uh, will go down, but people do find jobs. So the striking feature in the, deep, the depth of recession, people are finding jobs. And the way to do this in the literature is to think of this as a constant returns function. It can be um, any sort of, I mean, you can write down many different constant returns functions, right? Cobb Douglas is the one we like to play with because it's just very convenient, has a constant elasticity of the two arguments um, with respect to the output. Um, or the output with respect to the, to the arguments. So that's, uh, that's exactly what Cobb Douglas delivers us, but you can have a CES, you can have a, all sorts of translog variations, um, but they don't seem to help us much in terms of understanding the analytics, so we probably won't play with them. If you take any s constant returns function and divide it by any of those arguments, you end up getting a rate. So if you divide that thing by U, you get the job finding rate from the perspective of, a, of an unemployed person in the bathtub, and if you divide by vacancy, you get the vacancy success rate. And those two are obviously linked together uh, in a special way, which I've already mentioned a ton of times, but it's important to remember. Right, there it is. So think of theta in this model as being an endogenous outcome, and it is, this, it is kind of the, uh, the, a sufficient statistic of labor market tightness in this model. If you know what theta is, then you kind of know how tight the labor market is. It can be a big labor market, a small labor market. It's, it's the ratio that counts. And then again, we have this relationship between the, um, between the vacancy uh, finding rate and the job finding rate from the perspective of the worker. And it's, it's just a mul multiplication by labor market tightness. So that'll come in very handy in many times in this course. Okay, so it's, it's, um, it's almost like a trick question. You know, I tell you, if I tell you the matching function, uh, you can com compute both of those. If I tell you the, the job finding rate and I tell you the tightness from the perspective of the employer, then you can tell me the job success rate from the perspective of the, of the worker. Okay? That's just, a, that follows from constant returns. So you have this, the, this fact that workers love tightness and firms hate tightness. Tightness is kind of a burden. It's just, you know, you can, you can expend this, this vacancy search costs and you can, you can get a worker, but it just doesn't last. It, it, first off, it's not very effective, and then, and then given the tightness, it probably won't last very long, but uh, these things will come out later. But the point is, um, there's this conflict between the capitalist and the, the worker, and it, in this model, it runs along uh, theta. And if you just think of this, um, if these, these agents in the bathtub, these workers and these firms are actually identical ex ante. They all have the same probability of, of success and failure, and they also, when they're working, they have the same productivity, which is the beauty of this thing. Then we can also calculate the expected duration of the representative inhabitant of the bathtub um, that's unemployed, or the firm that's posting a vacancy that doesn't have a worker, okay? So we'll come back to that next week when we do we start thinking about search theory in, in, in detail. Okay, the other thing about the, the commonality with Pisarides is we have productivity. So remember the in the Pisarides model it was just it was just P. Okay, and, and I'm now gonna actually tweak things a little bit. I'm gonna say, let's suppose that it's instead of P, we're gonna call it S. And I'm gonna let S equal one afterwards, but um, later on, we could let S be a whole bunch of different values, and you could think of that as the segment of the labor market. So S equals 1 would be like brain surgeons, and then um, S equals 0.5 might be factory workers, and then S equals 0.3 might be people who work in the building cleaning business, that sort of thing, right? You could actually, and you could make it impossible for workers for, to leave one labor market to go to the other without doing something that's not even in the model. So it would be what we call a segmented labor market. So this is very broad, but right now we're gonna, we're gonna set e S equals one, and then you have this X part, which is the part that varies. And the, the assumption in Pisarides was that it's constant, but in the Morton's Pisarides version, as soon as you find a match, there's this constant probability or threat that, that there'll be a change, and if you start at one, it's always going to go down. And then after that, it might go up, it might go down. It depends on the distribution of, of productivity, which is assumed to be identical. So it's all very, very simple. So everyone's identical ex ante, 
and the, the probability of having a good or a bad shock is given by this F. The only thing that's different uh, across workers is that they may have had a shock recently or not. The probability of, in, of getting shocked is, is constant, and that's this Poisson arrival process. Right, so and it's good, useful to repeat this because this is kind of a constant theme in search is when you're looking, even if agents can turn down jobs, they still have this probability of, of getting a contact ex ante and there's a probability of, of whether this is a, an acceptable. So you can, you know, you can sort of decompose the probability into, into parts. And this is the first introduction to that notion. So there's a probability of, of a shock arrival. And then there's a, when, when, you, when that shock arrives, you have to get a draw. So you, you literally put your hand in a, in a, in a hat and you pull out a, pull out a number. That's your productivity, your new productivity. And that thing is distributed with a time invariant distribution. And you know that, okay? So it might be a very favorable distribution. It might be a lousy distribution. We're going to leave it unspecified, but it's, it's an increasing function because it's a distribution function. And it's, it's uh, at the top of the distribution, f is equal to 1, right? You can't do, you can't do any better than the top. And if, if you get the worst draw, uh, the probability of getting something less than that is 0. So those are the endpoints of the cumulative distribution function. Now this model has this reservation property. So something, something I'll repeat today that I talked about last week is that, um, again, holding the skill constant, we'll set it equal to one, um, if the shock that you draw low, lies below a certain value, then both parties will agree not to match. It's a, it's a common agreement, right? They just, we see this is not worth it. And you can, we'll show that uh, formally, but it, it's, it solves sort of a, like a, a value function uh, type of equation. It says the value of, of proceeding, um, given that my shock value is so low, isn't worth it. It's better to become, just to go off into the pool and start looking for another job again. And the same thing is true for the, for the firm. This is set up generally, but we'll talk about R later just because it's um, convenient. And later, at the end of the lecture, we'll come back and let S vary. So you'll see that this reservation property depends on the skill that you, the skill of the, or the productivity of the matches that are being generated in your little sub-labor market. But right now, we'll just keep it, keep it, keep it um, general. So you can see we also have a, we almost have a, a theory immediately of separation because the, the probability of separation, given that you have a job, is going to be the, the probability of arrival in the next short instance of time um, times the probability that the shock is bad enough to make you want to split up. And that's the definition of, of the reservation uh, level of productivity is. Okay, so the product of those two, they're independent um, by construction, measures the incidence. So it's like S in the Pizzarides model. So we have a theory already of S. We haven't explained R yet, but we're going we're gonna. Well, that's part of the, the job. And therefore, I mean, incidence of, that's a very important word in labor economics, the incidence of unemployment. What is the probability that you'll get hit? It could also be the incidence of, 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 uh, of um, getting a job offer from outside, even though you're working already. That's just an important concept. In terms of unemployment, the incidence of unemployment is uniform across types, because everyone's the same. It's going to be lambda times cap F of R. Easy, right? R is a measure of fragility. The higher R is, the higher the critical value of a new shock has to be that you stay on, on board. Otherwise, you separate. That's just a definition of, the, of, the, um, of, of what this R is supposed to be. But that's why R is a measure of fragility. So the higher R is, the more likely jobs are to dissolve in the next instant of time. Because given the incidents, we split up. OK? So R is endogenous in the Pizzarides models. We're going we're gonna to actually solve for it. We're going to solve for it diagrammatically. And we're also going to, if you have them, if you write down the equations, you can actually get a value for it. OK? And that, that thing can also depend on all the exogenous determinants of the model. Theta measures, that should be measures, labor market tightness. We already said that. So those are our two endogenous variables in the, Piz the Mortensen-Pissarides model. Any questions about that? Okay. 
So those things come out of several equations. They, they come out of the valuation of workers and firms, of having a worker matched with a firm or not, respectively. So competing from perspective, there's only a certain amount of surplus that can be split in every, in every instant of time, and uh, that's, that's going to have to be settled in the Nash bargain. But the outcome of the model is, is a solution of those four valuation equations, which are like Pissarides. That's the other similarity of Pissarides. And a bargaining process that, in the event that we're matched, how do we split this wonderful surplus with each other? Okay, and that plus the, the zero vacancy valuation condition gives us the, completes the model. So it's very similar to Pissarides. It's just a, it's a fancy version of Pissarides. And the fanciness comes from the fact that we don't have discrete time anymore. And discrete time means one, two, three. <laughs> and continuous time is, <laughs> it's like measuring the temperature at every point in the, in, in the day, right? You, and in a, that's, that's the advance of, of this setup, is that we can literally think of these firms and workers existing in this bathtub, and at every instant, at any point in time, uh, as you move through time, uh, there's a probability of, of something rupturing, if firms are employing workers uh, separate, or workers who are unemployed looking for vacancies find, uh, workers find the workers who are unemployed. Okay, so those are the four equations. I'll just re review them quickly. The more fancy version is the one that you like to pay attention to. But this is the, the left-hand side is, is the instantaneous implicit return of owning an asset. Remember, Lucas talked about assets. So being employed in the labor, labor market is like having an asset. It's my, my job. And I have productivity X. So it's a function. And that W, that capital W, is the value of that job. And in that instant of time, if I could put the, if I could sell my job and put money in a bank, I'd get R times that. That would be the, the, the flow return, if you like, from owning the asset W. That has to be, by definition, equal to the value of the wage I'm getting in that instant of time, given my productivity, which will be determined, plus this probability of getting zapped with a shock, and then, conditional on that, what is the probability that the shock will be bad enough that I'm going to lose the job, that I'm going to separate from my work, from my employer? And that's the, that's the second term. Okay. Now, the shock could also be a good one. It could be above the cutoff, and therefore I get possibly possibly not, um, an improvement, a capital gain, right? Because it's about R. It's not about, um, about it's, it's about an R given my current, my current value of X. So I get the whole, the integral here is basically taking the probability of each one of those values and summing them up over the in interval R to the top. And for every one of those values, I get a capital gain or a capital loss. So by starting at a, at a higher value of x, then um, the previous value, my new value, z, might imply a capital, capital loss. But I'm still going to stay with these guys, right? I'm going to stay with my boss. I'm not going to separate. So that's important. So that's kind of easy to understand. The firm's perspective is exactly the opposite. And again, I apologize here for the lack of a, a bracket. I still haven't fixed it. I tried to fix it, actually. Maybe it didn't accept it. <laughs> Maybe it's a projection problem. Um, in any case, you see what happens. The firm has this, the exact opposite perspective, but the firm has the exact same common value of, of the critical value on, on which we disagree, because we have the same information. We both know what the productivity is going forward, and we know the probability of, of these things going forward. So we have the same valuation. So you can see the joint surplus has to be a function of RW and RJ, right? Less what I could have on the outside, which would be RU and RV. So that's what we call the joint surplus. So we, we come together, we're forward looking, we know everything, um, and we kind of sit down and say, look, you know, this is, uh, uh, let's, how are we gonna split this? And let's negotiate. 
But the firms cannot influence these future values. That's, that's another very important assumption. Firms can't, and workers cannot um, do stuff out of equilibrium to influence those uh, things. Actually, the equilibrium is defined by many, many atomistic firms. That's just, that's just the end workers. That's the way the model works. People have tried to make these things more complicated. They are indeed more complicated. Okay, so uh, starting with this, um, we can um, simplify these expressions. That's what I did last time. And then we can actually look at the wage. If the wage solves some sort of Nash bargain, it's going to solve this expression. And the future values you know, can't be influenced. So when you do the Nash uh, solution, which is a sharing exercise, the firms and workers ignore any potential influence of their negotiation in this atomistic sense on future values. So the, the equilibrium or the first order condition for this problem is quite easy. It says that basically the joint surplus is split. Okay, and beta beta goes to the to the worker. Fraction beta. And one minus beta goes to the firm. So you can see that beta goes between zero and one on the open interval. So all Possible outcomes are possible. Okay, so the next step would be to impose V prime equals V equals zero. That's the zero uh, profit condition. And then substitute imposing this, even though the firms don't incorporate that into their calculus, when you solve for it, it simplifies quite radically. It looks very similar to what we had before, except now we have a wage equation that depends on the asset value of being unemployed. Right? Because if I fall into unemployment, I've got this, this asset, and it yields not just the benefit, it yields the probability of going back into a job. Okay, so it's, a, you know, it's kind of a recursive thing, but that's, that's the whole magic of this, this whole setup. Um, from the firm's perspective, um, of course, there's also some surplus, and using, again, we used, um, we used P in the, in the general case, I told you we're going to set p equal to 1. We'll, we'll, we'll do that um, later. But at any point in time, uh, you have x. So the wage equation depends on x. If, if, if your current x is very close to 1, you'll have a, a much higher wage than you would if you're very close to the, the, the truncation point, the cutoff point. Yeah. What do you mean by state continuous? It means that, well, the state is x. OK, so you can think of the. We, we use that word a lot in economics and macro to think about the, the current, um, I don't want to say the current state because that would be a re recursive definition, uh, but it's sort of the, the, the present um, unchangeable in that instant uh, values of the system. In this case, it's very simple. You know, either you're employed or unemployed, and if you're employed, you have a productivity and that productivity was the outcome of a random draw, and that's x. So given that you're still with the firm, this is the value of your, your productivity going forward. And it could change. I could change in the next instant with, a, with this Poisson arrival, but it could also be constant for a while. So over time, you might, you know, your, here's your job history. You might start with, um, you start with x equals 1. And for, not, for a long time, nothing happens. You got lucky. It's all about luck in this model. Okay, and then there's a bad shock, and, you, and your new value is there, and then another, you get hit with another shock, and maybe another, very quickly, in rapid, it's all, it's all probabilistic, and then here's our bar, and then the thing dissolves, right? Or it might have, con, con, in contrast, it might jump, it might go up here for a while, and you know, it's a little bit like a random, it's a little bit like, it's not a random walk because the increments don't, uh, don't accumulate, but it's, it, as long as you're above R, you're going to survive. That's the, way the, that's the way the optimal stopping problem is designed. Now, we just need to solve for R. That's, that's what we haven't done yet, and that's the whole point. That's what makes this a bit more special. Once we've got this, we can, we can go back and look at the zero profit condition on vacancies, and we can actually solve for the firms um, the value for which they say, OK, we're not going to continue this, right? Because we can go into the market and get get another. You got a question? If it all depends on luck and probability of shots, wouldn't everyone have the same? 
No, because, because we all have different histories. You might be very lucky at the beginning, and you might stay at one for a long time. You can solve for the distribution in equilibrium. Okay, that's, I'll mention that later, but no, that's, we're all different in this setup. It's, it's um, you know, pretty, pretty, um, pretty cool, actually. <laughs> because it may not, it, it, it's kind of part of the, it's part of the whole setup, is to have this heterogeneity. And it's a heterogeneity that we can manage. We don't have, people don't save in this model. They don't, they don't consume. So well, all we need to know is their productivity. If they started saving and had a budget, intertemporal budget constraint, then you'd have to track their wealth. That would be another state variable. And it would become extremely complicated, possibly uh, more relevant. We're going to claim that you know, for the labor market action, this is already quite an interesting set of tools to, to have. People have actually started to look into Thomas. Thomas's thesis is about what happens if you're in a model like this. People care about consumption, and they, they become heterogeneous ex post. And they'll, they'll actually save, they'll try to save more because they're, they're, they're risk, risk averse and they're prudent. So they're, they're really worried about losing their job and ending up in a really bad state, right? But you don't get that here because people treat income like income, right? They're all risk neutral. Okay, so the, that's wage determination. Um, again, I'm going to impose this now directly. And you get a very similar result to what we had with the Pissarides model, except now R shows up. So this is one of the determinants of R. Right? So this is a, again, if you, if you like, you can think of this as a demand and supply curve. Think of the, the JC curve as a little bit like a, um, a downward sloping curve, and it's a function of R. And R can only go up to one, right? You can't get more fragile than one. Fra R equals one means that <laughs> whatever job you have, it's going to blow up immediately, so forget it. So R is always going to be less than one strictly, but the closer you are to one, the more fragile jobs are. On the right-hand side, you've got the capitalized value of posting a vacancy. Okay, you can think of that. Using, using Q as a discount rate, so it's the expected, expected vacancy costs over the entire potential lifetime of a posted vacancy. Remember we said that the expected lifetime of a, of, a, of a vacancy was one over Q? Well, if you multiply one over Q times C, you get that on the left-hand side. So this is like the, this is the equilibrium condition uh, that corresponds to no firms, potential firms out there would like to post a vacancy because it's not worth it, so V is, not greater than zero, it's not less than zero, it's equal to zero. Okay, that's, that's, that's a negatively sloped curve. Now the other part is, is going to specify under what conditions do a firm actually cut, cut their losses or the firm and the worker jointly cut their losses. Okay, so we know that's, that's R. And we also know that, that unemployed workers are only going to participate if this condition is, is met. It just basically means that the, the, um, the value of, of being in the labor force has to be a bit more than B. It's not, because you're gonna, you always have this possibility of getting a, a job offer. And in equilibrium, it's going to be this, this second term. If you want to learn, if you want to see how that is derived, uh, I, I skipped the steps in this, in this lecture, but it's quite easy. It's just applying the, the equilibrium condition for the for the labor market, vacancy is equal to zero, and the, the wage equation. Just, it's, it's, it's a little bit like the Pissarides model. Now if you plug that into the job destruction condition, um, you end up getting this sort of indifference from the work. Remember, the firm and the worker have the same, the same objective view of what the surplus is. So when the, when the firm thinks that the the, the job surplus has gone to zero, then it must be the case the workers had the same feeling because they're always sharing it. So if the, if the, if the firm says, look, the, the, the surplus is gone, it's negative. If we stay together, we're, we're burning up resources. The, the, the worker will also say, hey, you're right, I agree. So let's split up. So the critical value will be one from the firm side or the worker side, we'll take the worker's perspective, the worker is indifferent between continuing and jumping ship, going into the labor, into the unemployment pool. 
And the unemployment pool value is this R times U, and the, the left-hand side is the value of working at, again, this is, we've, we've set P equal one here implicitly, okay, because we're, we're gonna freeze out pro productivity changes right now. So you're at the, when R is basically, you're working at R, your, your productivity is R, and there's a, there's a little bit of a chance that you'll get a shock that actually is better than, than R. You're at R, and there's a, there's, a, you know, there's a lambda chance that you'll get this shock, and if P is equal to one, we can eliminate that as well. And this is kind of like the, the capitalized value of that option value of getting a little bit better than you have right now. So, you know, having a productivity at R is, is not sufficient to dissolve the match, because there's, things can always turn up. They can also turn down, but to make you indifferent between unemployment as a worker and staying on the job, it has, in some sense, the productivity has to be a little bit better than this R value, because things can get better, okay? And if you basically manipulate that using the first equation, you get the job destruction condition. That's the, that's the, the pair of R and theta that make the worker in the firm just indifferent between calling it quits and continuing another, another instant of time, DT. Okay, so that's this, this magic. I mean, economics is all about indifference conditions, right? Um, margins, and, and this, is a, this is one that kind of falls out of the blue. It just says basically, this con the condition for our action, quit, break up, divorce, has to make us in indifferent between doing it and staying. So that's it. Wait, so the in equilibrium this holds for all the matches? No, it just no, it determines it holds for the critical value, for the reservation value. It's a determinant of the reservation value. So some, many many matches will be above the reservation value. Some will have X's that are close to one. But all have the common view as to what value of R makes us really ready to call it quits. It's like the how unpleasant does your, does your marriage have to be before you get divorced? <laughs> and, and on the other hand, you can think about it, it makes perfect sense. Things can always get better. Maybe you start to get along with your partner, okay? So you don't wanna, you don't wanna, you know, you, you wanna have a little bit of optimism. So this optimism is like the option value. I mean, it's, it's actually not emotionally driven optimism, it's actually objectively driven optimism. It's like the option value. Because if you break up, you can't get that person anymore. It's over, right? And that's, so. So let's think about these reforms. What were they? I told you already, it's a long time ago. That's a really long time ago. <laughs> so Schroeder, the German Bundeskanzler, made this speech in 2002 in the parliament, and he said, we're gonna have the, we're gonna, um, he had a special name for it. I forgot what he called it. It was called the um, Agenda, Agenda 2010. I think the, the new, he was trying to, you know, you always have to put a label on it. So he wanted to change the labor market because Germany was in trouble. Germany was in a deep recession and people, uh, there's a huge unemployment problem, in, especially in East Germany, where a lot of East German industry was just obsolete and the people were unemployed and they could never be reemployed at their old jobs. So unemployment insurance really was kind of a false promise. Usually unemployment insurance is to help people uh, tide, tide themselves over until they get the, a new job that corresponds to their old skills. But if you were working in the uranium plants in, in, uh, in East Germany, it was probably not very likely you are gonna get a job in that sector, so you had to change. So the hearts reforms were kind of mostly addressed at East Germany, but also at West Germany. There was a feeling that there was People were turning down jobs too much. They weren't even trying to search anymore. So how do we motivate people to search? So they had these, these four laws. And the first one was created the mini jobs and the deregulated temporary helping agencies, Zeit, Zeit um, Arbeit. It was a big deal back then. Now it's considered pretty common, but um, it was highly regulated up until 2002. Okay, so th this made it easier for firms to reduce Vacancy posting costs, perhaps. Um, again, it's, it's sometimes you have to be careful not to, to, 
to overinterpret these things, but that's why we have the second version of the model I'll talk about in a second. Hearts 3 was very important because it reformed the way the, the, the employment offices work. Back in those days, they were called Arbeitsamt, like Postamt. <laughs> and after the reforms, they called themselves Agentur. So it's like a service, you know, their, their business was to provide service, not to, to, you know, yes, I will sell you a postage stamp if you give me this and, and you wait in line. This is like, we're going to give you a service. Dienstleistungsgesetz. They, go, they, they called all, all sorts of labels. So the idea was to make it easier to get information on job alternatives, which was very good. It was like Germany enters the digital age uh, with respect to uh, jobs because you could not find out if you were in Bavaria, what was available in Berlin. It was just impossible. You'd have to probably write a letter to the, to the Arbeitsamt. Um, but after this, they put it all on a single computer, and now it's very easy to find out what's available. And again, you have no excuse now. You can't say, well, I don't, I don't know about that. Well, they tell you. Here it is. Assuming that the job um, is posted on, on the... On the Bundesagentur für Arbeit. That's the, what they call themselves. And the most important reform was, was reforming the access of workers to unemployment insurance and benefits. So in Germany, like every other industrial country, if you work for a certain number, number of years, you qualify for employment in, unemployment insurance, which is unconditional. So if you lose your job, it's your right to get so and so much money, 63% uh, of your income, for uh, two and a half years, it was, back in the day. Two and a half years. So a lot of people said, oh, that sounds like a good vacation to me. Um, some people didn't say that. Some people really wanted to find a job and maybe had problems finding a job because it wasn't around the corner like the other one was. So there are all sorts of, you know, this optimal amount of pressure and, and encouragement, whatever. And other countries like Denmark and um, the Netherlands had already gone through similar reforms in the 1990s. So the Germans kind of said, well, we can't be the last people involved. We have to think hard about this. More importantly is the follow-up. So after two and a half years of unemployment insurance, which is your right, and a lot of people see it as their right, I'm entitled to that. After that, the government kicks in and says, okay, you didn't, you're not... You've exhausted your insurance, but now I'm going to give you benefits. Okay, and it was called Arbeitslosengeld. Oh, sorry, Arbeitslosenhilfe. Arbeitslosengeld is the insurance. Arbeitslosenhilfe was the unconditional support. So you had to be poor enough. You had to have no assets. You can't have a Mercedes Benz. You have to. I mean, you can have a car, but you can't have. You can't be rich to get the Arbeitslosenhilfe. That was the old system. But people were managing to still collect it for years and years and years. In many European countries, people had been unemployed for 10 years, right? And, you know, they just weren't looking anymore. So are they really unemployed? So Schroeder's idea was we have to reform this. So the reform was to get rid of the second part, Arbeitslosenhilfe. Just get rid of it and call it Arbeitslosengeld 2 and make it conditional on you looking for a job. So sounds pretty reasonable. Unemployment was 15% um, if, at times. So a lot of Germans thought that was okay. The SPD was very, very torn because Workers' Party, Social De Democratic Party. And um, so Schroeder was very unpopular after he did this, but he managed to push it through Parliament. And, um, and we will show that actually it did make a difference. I think it did. But it took many years, and Schroeder didn't get any of the benefit Actually, all the credit was given to Angela, Angela Merkel. Yeah. And they reduced the, the hours of the deadlines uh, duration, right? But is it, isn't it they, reduced it to, they reduced it to one year. That's right. I didn't mention that. Yeah, so they, they reduced a lot of stuff. And the, and the model that only comes out with B, you know, it's just B, but it does, the, they, they made it harder to stay on, they've increased it since. So if you're over 55, I think you can get a year and a half of Arbeitslosengeld. And again, people say, well, I've paid into this system. My boss paid into the system. I, this is my right. Okay? And that's, you can make that argument. I mean, but it creates a moral hazard situation because a lot of people will say, well, it's my right, and therefore I'm not going to accept this job even though it involves getting in the S-Bahn and going to Wannsee. Right? Because I think there's going to be a job around the corner that is easier to get to, and I don't have to spend time in the S-Bahn. And do you 
you know of the, the penalties that um, Mike talked about? That, yeah. Uh, were they also introduced with the Yes. Well? Yes, so 2005 was the introduction of the, of the, of all these aspects. So the reduction of the benefit, um, Arbeitslosenhilfe, Arbeitslosengeld, um, reduction of the, the duration, making it harder to get it, and then making it important that you actually undertake thing, undertake effort uh, if they call you. And the, the, they call the, it's called the sanction, the pun, it's like a, like a, a penalty. So if you turn down three job offers or a certain number of job offers, then uh, they can reduce your benefits by a certain amount. And that was, that's been fine-tuned and it's also very local. So in Berlin, they don't do it as much as they would in Bavaria. So it's, it's kind of a, um, but in any case, at the time, the, the, the debate was quite intense and people began to realize this is really putting pressure on people to accept jobs. So you can think of this in the, in the sense of our model as just a reduction in B. Yeah? Because the fault, the, Whatever you get when you're unemployed is just not as attractive. Yes? Um, I'm wondering if in the model we consider informal labor funds. So if you, you can put it in. Unemployed for 10 years, but like yeah. That would have the effect of increasing B because it's not the official labor market, but it would increase your, the, val the flow value of being unemployed because you could, you could make buy by selling uh, junk at the. At the uh, the uh, flea market, or you can, you know, you can work. You can work for yourself. I mean, you can actually take care of your. If you take care of your own children instead of putting them in a, in daycare, that's that increases B. I mean, it makes it more, less painful to be unemployed. Right? Or being employed under the table, like taking money from, like working at a cafe, for example. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's not, it, the, the actual, that involves work, so it's, there's some unpleasantness. If you work in a cafe for cash, um, you know, there's, you're still working. So it, there, there are people who have looked at this having segmented labor markets. So you have like a, a formal labor market, then you have a dual labor market or a segmented um, market where you can just, you know, it makes it more complicated. So you have to have, you have to have all these, these conditions and they, it's it's uh, it's been done. Okay, uh, it, again, this is just to make give the basic flavor. So the question, of course, is whether this had an effect. And there's a big debate. And now we have this. The current government wants to introduce the Bürgergeld, which is is clearly increasing B. There's no question about it. You may be for that. The model doesn't give you any reason to be against it or for it, except for unemployment. But you might say it's fair to give people a higher B. Because in the real world, a lot of people have no encounter with unemployment, and a lot of people get a lot of unemployment. So you might feel more concerned about the, the poor people. Right? That's unfortunately not in the model, but um, objectively, you could think of this whole reform as being uh, you know, increasing B. That's one way of thinking about it. Probably not changing the other stuff. I don't think they're going to take the computers out of the Bundesagentur, Bund Bund <laughs> right? <laughs> Burn up the internet connections and, and do that. That's not going to happen. They may make it easier to reject offers, so you, you may not have to search as much, but search is not a, an essential part of this. The only search involved is the effectiveness of the matching function. So you might say, okay, it's not exactly the same thing, maybe we need to wait with our, with our course, but... Um, you could argue that if the Bundesagentur doesn't make you take the job in Brandenburg, even though you live in Berlin, it's not very far, then it's not the same as it was, was 15 or 20 years ago. Right? So it could be like A going down. We called it A, the, the, the shift of the, of the matching function. OK, so again, this is the magic picture that Thomas probably showed you already. If not, he will. Um, it, it looks like a demand and supply curve, but of course it's not. Um, the price is this cutoff, the critical value. You know, that's the critical value that we're endogenously determined in the model. We're determining that and we're determining this labor market tightness endogenously. So you need those two conditions. One is the condition for the, the job creation, which says that for, a for any value of the cutoff, productivity has to be sufficient or the labor market tightness has to be sufficient to make it attractive for firms to enter 
and post a vacancy. Okay, so again, holding, you, can, you know, th these curves are wonderful if you think about it. I mean, they, they basically are asking the question, under what conditions if I hold this constant, what is the condition consistent with equilibrium of theta? So if, if matches are really fragile, the labor market has to be less tight from the firm's perspective, and we kind of, we know why, because the tighter the labor market is, the less attractive it is for the firm to have a vacancy posted because it's going to take forever to fill it, right? So if, if theta is high, Q is low, Q is low, C over Q is high. Okay, I may have gone too fast for you, but it's just, it's just logical. The tight, firms hate tight labor markets. It's just a fact. I mean, they, I mean this, is, this is even more agreement on that statement. There's more agreement on that statement than there is that wages are too high or too low. Because tightness, you know, it's all, it's all well and good to have a wage in your mind, but if you can't find any workers, it doesn't matter. So you need a worker. So the tighter labor markets are, the higher theta is, the looser or the more slack labor markets are, the lower theta, the happier firms are, and they're willing to basically cope with a high cutoff, because a high cutoff means that I place the worker, but it's very likely it'll blow up in the next few instant, few minutes or hours or days. Okay, so it's a, it's a trade-off. It's a negatively sloped um, curve. And the job destruction condition we discussed already, it's, this, it's, the determ it's the common values of R and theta that are consistent with um, just being indifferent to maintaining the match and not or blowing, letting it blow up. Okay, and the equilibrium is, of course, the intersection, so that's where we're going to be. Everything else is, is out of equilibrium from one perspective or the other. And then we just have to say, okay, what happens when one of these parameters changes? Um, and then we can go through the hearts thing. So this is the opposite of hearts. Hearts was to reduce B. This is the comparative statics for increasing B. So if you reduce B, you're going to shift the line down to the right, right? Go in, in, in this direction. It's, it's a very symmetric model. Okay, so I'm going to consider, if you think about it, this is, this is, the, this is what the Pizzarides model, Morton's and Pizzarides model says about, um, would say about, um, an increase in, in B from its current position. So it's kind of like, it's the critique of the opposition. Okay, so what do you see happening? You see the, the JC curve doesn't change because B doesn't enter it directly. Right? The, the creation condition doesn't matter. It de the creation depends on theta, but theta is endogenous. But in terms of the parameters, this is, what, this is why it's fun to play with these models with, with diagrams. You don't have to use all the, you don't have to differentiate totally and you do that, but you get the same answer, right? So this would predict that indeed the, the outcome would be exactly what the CDU is claiming, okay? Job matches will be more fragile, more likely to blow up in any given time, and labor markets will be less tight, so unemployment will rise and vacancies will fall. Okay, and again, I'm, this is without judgment. You might think that's a great thing. Maybe, maybe um, you know, we need to have different different welfare function. My welfare function is is just looking at this model, <laughs> but that may be the wrong welfare function. Maybe it's better to have uh, workers who are unemployed getting a bit more money, and that's fine. But I just want you to understand that's the way this model works, and it's clear it's going to make it's going to raise unemployment. It's going to undo the Hearts reforms a little bit. I don't think it's going to be that much because what they're talking about is is not just raising benefits. They're also talking about making it less risky to turn down the job offer. Because in the old system, if you said no, I, I've, I've turned down three job offers, and they say we're going to cut your benefits now. Okay, that's that's also a, can be studied in this model. You had a question? Yeah. So when we say that theta increases or decreases, can we We can, but we have to go back to the equilibrium condition for unemployment. Remember, uh, that's a good, very good question. Remember, yeah. what is U? And you should all know this by heart. <laughs> uh, F plus F no. 
Okay, it's s divided by s plus f, but now we have a theory for s, and we also have a theory for, for f. So it's going to be lambda times f of r and lambda times f of r. And those things are all kind of given to us by our diagram, so we can compute u anytime we want. And you can say, well, why don't you have a diagram for that? Well, I'm, I'm kind of lazy. <laughs> There's no reason to do it, because if you, if you look at it carefully, you can see right away an increase in R makes jobs more fragile. It's going to increase the unemployment rate. It's going to increase the inflow rate in, a, in any given level of outflow. And if you increase theta, holding R constant, it's also clear. It's going to reduce unemployment, right? Yeah. I think. Oh, <laughs> that's very advanced. That sounds like a thesis, <laughs> a dissertation. Yeah, sure, of course. I mean, what do you think? What, what, what determines V? I mean, it's, part of it is, is government. So you have to have a theory of government, political economy of unemployment benefits. Or it could also be the household deciding, do I take care of my children or do I hire someone to take care of my children? If I hire someone, I have to earn money, then I have to have income. If I, work, if I cook my own meals, I don't have to... I don't have to have so much benefit from the state. I just cook my own meals. I was thinking of like taxing the workers for work, so yeah. and then like yep. raise the fee on the other side. So I don't think we would see such an impact, like because increasing the fee means like less workers working. Yeah, okay. I I've actually when I was your age I wrote a paper like that. <laughs> I have a paper where you um, have a government taxing the employed workers and using that money to pay the unemployed. Mm -hmm. So you end up having a, um, you end up getting a different shape for some of these curves. So if you go back to the Pizzarides model, then the, um, the vacancy, uh, what's, what do we call it? The, um, the vacancy supply curve is no longer a straight line, it bends. So you can actually have a multiple equilibrium. You can have an equilibrium where unemployment is very high. We tax the firms very high. Workers get money, and they don't feel like working. And workers are not, um, you know, in that model, workers are still working the same intensity, but there are fewer vacancies because firms don't want to be, there's no surplus because the, the government takes the surplus away. OK, so it's possible. That's, that's a kind of a trivial. Um, <laughs> Without criticizing myself, it's kind of a, it's almost, in retrospect, it's kind of a trivial modification, but it does work. It's exactly right. You end up getting, um, you change the properties of the model. Okay, anybody else on that? So you can also try to change the ability of, of workers to get a bigger piece of the pie. So this would be like, a, this would be like um, um, increasing workers' bargaining power, some people say, say things like co-determination or like, you know, giving workers more rights, uh, making it harder to... Uh... When you say fire workers, it's difficult because it's not really that in this model. It's really just about splitting the surplus. But any way that you make the workers have, um, have stronger bargaining position would cause both curves to shift. And so you have an... You can see it's ambiguous with respect to R. So you could, we wound up here, but that's just because I drew the curves the way I did. You could actually land, land above. But what's clear is that theta goes down. So workers um, face a higher unemployment rate. The labor markets are, are less tight as a result. So paradoxically, busting unions can actually increase labor market tightness for firms. So they think they like busting unions, but I, or I say busting unions, making un workers less strong can actually work, can backfire, but it can also, it makes labor markets very tight for them, which firms may not like. Okay, so again, this doesn't capture all the aspects of labor and management and industrial relations, but it's interesting, right? You get it? Yeah, is that because if a higher beta leads to higher wages and then firms both as they increase because they know yeah. they will get less of the surplus? In equilibrium, yeah, in equilibrium. I mean, you just have to just reverse what I did before. You don't know where this is going to be. It could be down here. You know, it could be down here. Oops. It could be down here. Um, 
And what determines that is the extent of the shift. So we need, we need to know we need to do the comparative statics with math, and then know know the functions and maybe do 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 some some simulations. But um, to know to know exactly where you wind up with respect to R. But it's uh, you know that's economics is honest. It's saying the same. It's ambiguous, and you shouldn't judge it. I mean, you shouldn't say this is great or bad. It depends on your on your welfare function or your your preferences. Okay, it's always that way. And this is the one, this would be undoing the Hartz reform effect on matching. So this would be like making the matching function less effective. You know, the matching function is like this production function, and you just make it, you know, Hartz reforms made it more effective, and that m moved the, um, the JC curve downward to the left, and now we're undoing it, <laughs> uh, possibly making jobs more fragile and increasing, uh, increasing labor market tightness. So that sounds like a bad deal for the firms. Firms want to find workers, right? So, I mean, in a sense, um, increasing, increasing theta means that all things given, job markets are, have more fragile matches on average and it's really hard to find workers because matching is ineffective. Yeah, this is making it go up. This is this is making means more yeah means more effective. What am I talking about? Right. Good point. <laughs> it sounded so good before. Okay. So this is the Hartz reforms. Exactly. Okay. Hartz reforms made made labor markets tighter. And then abolishing the Hartz reforms in the sense that I said would make would make jobs less less fragile and increase slack in the labor market, reduce labor market tightness. That's the correct way of thinking it. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So the evidence for Germany, I think this is it's very rare in economics that you get data like this uh, that looks so unambiguous. So this is, the Hartz reforms are, like I said, around 2003, 2005, and um, these are aggregate numbers um, based on micro data, things like the finding rate. So how many, how many unemployed persons per year on average in the month of the 12 months found a job? as a fraction of all unemployment. That would be F. So you can see F rose slightly. S you, you, looks, looks flat, but if you go over here and blow it up, blow the scale up, you see that it actually fell quite a bit. Because S, S is, in, in Pissarides, it's, in more than some Pissarides, it's, it's lambda times F of R. Okay, so it clearly went down. So jobs became more secure since the Hartz reforms. There's been less separation. Okay, and of course you, this is a model where separations are mutual, but in any case they have declined dramatically. So, you know, the, the, they did provide this, this uh, increase in, in job security, even though that wasn't the express intent of the, of the, of the legislation. Unemployment went down, that's well known. So people think that was a success. Like I said, it was 12% around 2005. These are an annual averages, so in the, the, the worst part of the recession it was higher, and then it fell to now, it's now under 5%, but in uh, 2017 it was around, around 6%. Okay. And I think that's all I wanted to say right now. Yeah, another thing is that labor force participation actually went up. It's not in the model, but um, increasing labor market tightness, which is this one. Okay, so theta really exploded, no question about it. That makes it attractive for people on the sidelines who aren't supposed to be jumping in in this model because it's, it's a fixed labor force. But in fact, they did come in. So a lot of people who 
you know, were kind of discouraged out of the labor force, they came in. So the, the model that this, this picture is based on was a paper that I wrote recently where I actually flesh out this margin as well. So you have three margins. You can, you can, or three things you can be doing. You can be working, you can be unemployed and searching, or you can be out of the labor force. Right? And those three constitute the labor, the, the, the labor force potential or the, the, work, the workforce, the working age population. Okay, so let's, let's spend the last few minutes of the, of the class talking about how to extend this model. So this is, this is a paper that um, doesn't get enough attention. It's in the Handbook of Labor Economics, and it's pretty, pretty clever. So they, just, they think of everything that happens in the labor market and try to throw it into this, into, <laughs> into this box. Okay? It's a policy-oriented paper, so they, they basically ask the question, what would happen if Europe which at the time had a higher rate of unemployment than the United States. What would happen if Europe adopted American institutions? And what would happen if America adopted European institutions? What do I mean by that? Europeans have better unemployment benefits, lower taxes. They also have job protection. How do you model job protection in the Mortens and Pissarides model? Well, you can. And that's what they show in this paper. Job protection is, is meaning if you want to fire me, you got to pay a lot of money. You got to pay a lot of money to me, and you got to pay a lot of money to my lawyer, or the Amtsgericht, or the Arbeitsgericht, right? You have to pay some, it's like a, like a hidden tax, a third party tax. Okay, so now I'm going to bring back S. Remember, I, I set S equal to 1. Now I'm going to let S be anything on the open interval between 0 and 1. So it basically sub, it segments labor markets. So low S means I'm a Low skilled worker, and if high S means I'm a high skilled worker, and I can't cross the borders in this model, so you can't become a high skilled worker through training. Um, you could probably, you could do that, but again, these are very complicated setups with states and changing, and so it's not easy. To, it's not easy to do it for an introductory class. The MP model allows us to introduce all sorts of distortions, so not just the a tax or a labor tax or income tax, a vacancy tax. You can put all sorts of crazy things in here. But you also can make it costly to move from one state to the other. So to dissolve your match, you may have to pay some money. And if you, if you join a firm to become a match, you may have to pay a, a training cost. You may have to pay it or your boss may have to pay it. And in the end, in this model, we share everything. So it basically shared surplus. So if my boss has to pay for my training, then I better not expect very high pay because otherwise he wouldn't give me this offer, right? And we're negotiating over the wage. Somehow we're going to share this burden between the two of us. So this involves a lot of different things we could think about. So that's why I like this. So we can think about unemployment insurance. We already talked about that. We can talk about labor taxes and subsidies. So you can, in France, they, they subsidize firms for picking up workers that have very high unemployment histories and bad training. So it's like, a, it's like giving them a little bit of money and the firms you know, <laughs> take part of it, but they also give the workers some, right? It's, uh, it's exactly what we'd expect in the model. Um, you can think of severance taxes. So if you, if you end up breaking up with a, with a worker, you, a firm, have to pay money to the government, maybe to the labor ministry, or you have to go to court, pay a lawyer, or you can actually pay the worker. Severance pay means you actually give the worker something. And those are different because the worker gets a piece of gets the money. Um, in the case of a tax or a lawyer's fee, then it just goes off into 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 the air, it just evaporates. It's a loss to everybody. You had a question. Uh, isn't this like taking the efficiency of the model under the mesh solution? I mean, it would be. For example, for the, the worker would invest in, him, in himself less to, to get the training if he's, yeah, it, it's like this negotiation thing uh, was applied. Is this going to happen somehow? Well, in, in this model, the, the, the training is not, is, it's not an investment decision like you're, you're describing. So you're, you're thinking of a worker entering the labor market, buys herself some skills, and then enters the labor market versus on the job training. So it's a, it's a much more complicated setup. And, the, and you have threats, and you can do this and that. Um, this is a very simple setup. 
but keep it in mind. Maybe it's a nice, a nice application. Um, so you can think about training costs. You can think of apprenticeships. You can think of uh, government action intervention. And you can think of taxes. So you can actually make the budget balance. The firm has to pay. You know, in, in Germany, firms and workers pay a lot of money that they never see. They pay it right to some government pot of money. So the pension system, unemployment benefit system, the Bismarck system says that firms and workers have to bear this. It's not supposed to really be subsidized by the taxpayer, the other taxpayers. But in fact, it is. But in, in principle, it's not. So your healthcare system, all these things are huge costs that you'll never see because you never look at your paycheck carefully. And your company's paying the same thing. So if you're working for DIW, you know, you're, getting, you're getting a paycheck. But if you look really carefully, you see that, that the gross labor cost the firm is paying on your behalf, your, your contributions as well as the firm's, they're a huge chunk of your, of your cost to the firm. So the firm has to pay twice as much as you're getting after taxes, at least, right? In the Netherlands is even more. So that's, that's something we really want to think about because that money goes somewhere and it distorts the firm's incentives to create jobs. We have to accept that, we have to accept that, otherwise, where are you gonna get the, the money? So you might say, well, let's just do general income tax or value added tax, but that would be violating the Bismarckian principle that in this country is incredibly holy. <laughs> you know, Bismarck, for all his faults, was actually very clever. He managed to, man to, to keep social conflict in, in check by making firms and workers pay for their own social security instead of well, the alternative. That's a different, different lecture. <laughs> okay. So you can't study this in very well with, mat, with demand and supply curves. So let's go back. Um, we still have this sensitivity um, to the skill level. So now we're going to index skill by S. We're, therefore, the, 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 um, the expected arrival time of, of a bad shock um, is the expected duration of my job. It's going to depend on my own labor market's value of RS. So if R is really close to 1, then jobs aren't going to last very long. There's, it's going to get, keep blowing up. And you know, maybe that's not such a bad thing. I get another job if I lose my job, if, if labor markets are tight. Um, so we've got a, a unique value of S for each labor market. right? Depending, and that's, that could explain already why in the tourist industry, you know, S is kind of high. And if you work in an office in the finance sector, S is very low. Right? Okay, so everything else is just the same. Basically, we have this exogenous skill class. That's your, your fate. You're, you're a doctor. You're a professor at a university. Or you're, you know, you, 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 you're a bricklayer. That's your job. That's your labor market, S. And then that scales X. X has the same properties as before. It's between 0 and 1. And uh, when you have a, an employer and you're in this situation, it changes according to this Poisson arrival, so that's pretty easy. Risk, workers are risk neutral. I'm going to change a little bit. Instead of a constant vacancy cost, now I'm going to make it depend on how skilled you are. And this makes sense. If you go to a headhunter, if you want to get a, a woman who works as a, as a CFO in, in the tech industry, good luck. There are like 50 of those in Germany. <laughs> so you go to a headhunter, and they take a lot of money. So you find this, this wonderful lady, you're going to pay a whole lot of money just to get that person through the door. That's the way it works. So that, that's the headhunter. It depends on, on the skill. Okay. Um, that's going to be interesting, because that could change, right? The, the K um, is going to be scaled by your skill. Still have the zero profit condition, therefore we have this um, B equals zeros curve, and we also have the same equilibrium condition for unemployment. When that thing's equal to zero, we have the unemployment rate. We can back that out of the, as a steady state condition. So we know this stuff already, it's pretty easy. We use the match surplus to determine the real wage, as before. Um, B and beta is given. Wages are completely flexible. There's a little bit of a trick here. You have to th remember, 
um, the wage is only, is only fixed when you have the Nash bargain. As soon as something happens, then you, you get to renegotiate. There's no reason to negotiate in this world until this Poisson arrival occurs. It's kind of a sneaky assumption of Pizzarides, but I think it's great. I mean, Martin Pizzarides killed it with this. So what are we going to put in there? We're going to put in all sorts of cool stuff. We're going to have, a, we're going to have B as before, but now we're going to have wage-dependent unemployment insurance, but it's going to be dependent on your average wage in the past, which is given. Okay, so we're not going to make it so complicated. It's basically going to be your, your history is given, and rho is this wage-dependent part of unemployment benefits. And you can, now, you're going to, now it gets really interesting. So we have a hiring subsidy. We're going to have a hiring cost. And it all depends on the skill. So the more skilled you are, the more, the more costly it is to, to um, hire somebody. And it's also more costly to fire them. And when you fire them, I'm not going to tell you where T goes yet, but T could go to the government, or it could go into space, or it could go into the pockets of the workers. And now someone's got to pay for this fund, so we're going to tax employers. You could tax workers, but it's not going to matter in this setup because it's all part of the surplus. And there's a vacancy posting cost, which now I'm going to relate to K. Okay. So you put all this together, and you get valuation equations which are a little bit more complicated, right? Because you've got all these things going on. So look at this. Still, it's the same idea. You have an asset. So if you were a firm with a worker in hand, you could sell that asset, and you would get J for it. And you could invest that in the bank, and you'd get R times J. That's the flow of having the asset of a worker at skill, J, skill X. So what do you get? Well, you get the productivity. Then you've got to pay all this money. You've got to pay these guys. You've got to pay the worker. You've got to pay the worker's taxes. From the firm's perspective, even if the firm pays the, whoever pays the taxes, the firm has to generate the surplus to pay the worker. And then you have these, these events that could happen. So here's the event. This is the event that we get a shock that is acceptable from both sides of the party, meaning that it's greater than R. OK? And that's the capital gain or loss within the range of acceptability. And then you have the probability that the thing goes belly up and you separate from the worker. Okay. Now, if you separate from the worker, what do you do? Well, you lose what you had, but you also have to pay this tax, this severance tax. I like to think of this as just having to go into a labor court and fight, fight, this, fight this out. Now, the worker doesn't have to get that. You could, you can actually add to them. I'm, I'm going to use their specification. The worker could be getting T or get a fraction of T. Okay? And that would change the properties of the model. It turns out that if, if T is received fully by the worker, then it's neutral. It has no effect. Right? Because workers and firms know that. As long as T is not so big that it sucks away all the surplus in expected value, it's a transfer. But what's important is this one does not show up here. Okay, So it is kind of an asymmetric burden on the separation. Okay, So the second equation is the, the, firm's, the worker's perspective. The worker has the same type of asset. Um, it has value W, capital W. And it has a period-by-period uh, period, um, interest uh, at a little r. So for the, for the next instant, it would be r times w. That's going to be equal in, in an arbitrage sense, by definition, if you like, to the return of having that job, which is the wage. And the, the worker doesn't pay any direct taxes herself. It's all paid for by the firm just because of the, for simplicity. And then you have these two events, a shock that's good and a shock that's not good. Shock that's not good means it's, it's under R and it leads to a separation. OK, that's, that's the, the, the wonderful side of having a job <laughs> and all its risks, but you could also be unemployed. I'll just skip to the last two equations. OK, so here it's, it's very similar to what we had before. Because all firms and all workers, when without a worker, have the same 
the same features. There's no such thing as a good vacancy or a bad vacancy in this model. But if you're a firm with a vacancy, if you do hire, then you're going to have to you're going to have to pay um, some costs. You may get a subsidy H, but you have to pay some some training costs C, and it's just money. So in this model, it doesn't you can imagine those costs could be in kind. You have to send a worker to a what they call an inum, you know, like a training center to learn how to cut hair. Okay, it might even be subsidized, but you can't get money, can't get money for it. But the value is still there, so the worker will value that. You know, it's going to go into the into the surplus pan, if you like, onto the onto the the scales. And here's this, the perspective of the of the unemployed worker, the last equation. So you, you might say, well, what about this this J zero and and U Z W zero? Those are the initial. Uh, valuations conditional on finding a job. So that's when x equals 1 at the top. And in the very instant you sign the, the document, sign the contract, things can start changing. Okay, so the, the valuation of the match as it's formed has to be at the top. That's another reason why this is very convenient compared to the, um, the paper that I mentioned before by, by uh, Ramey and co-authors where they actually let the, the value, the initial product be anywhere in the, in the, on the map. It just makes it more complicated. The last thing I want to mention is this. This defines basically mutual agreement. Uh, both of us, we can't force the worker to work for us. We run into them in the, in the pool. You know, it has to be mutual agreement. So both have to be willing to do this. And the, the value, the cutoff value for the labor market is going to be basically the the one that's bearable to both sides. It has to be acceptable to firm and worker. You can't force firms to hire workers. You can't force workers uh, to work for firms. Okay, so these are indifference conditions. The firm is indifferent between when, when, when the vacancy value, when the productivity value reaches RE, then the firms are indifferent between paying the severance tax uh, moving into the vacancy mode. That's kind of easy to understand. And the worker is indifferent between being unemployed. These kind of indifference curves come up again and again in the search model. When you're looking for a job and you get an offer, which comes from a, a distribution, you're going to take, you're going to take those, those wage offers that, ex, that exceed your reservation wage. It's a very similar idea here. This is the reservation productivity. There are no, the wage is completely allocational in this model. It's just a matter of, you know, my wage is high, your profits are low. Your profits are high, my wage must be low, given productivity. That's the way this works. Okay, so once we get that, we can go off and, and, and use the same types of ideas. And if you read that paper, the 99 paper, they actually go into some detail. You can change all these things and ask, okay, which curves are shifting? And they, because it's very difficult sometimes, in, in, it's better just to calibrate the model and do it with a computer. Okay, so that's kind of giving up on the <laughs> kind of giving up on the on the beauty of, of a two-dimensional representation, which I like. I like that. It's the way I was raised. Okay, but um, let me just go through here quickly. This is just a repetition of what we said before. Going to change those uh, things in this context. The wage has to, to be Nash bargained. So we, we're together. We sit in a room. And we, you say, OK, here's my surplus, you worker. And the firm says, hey, here's my surplus. It's the surplus minus what you get. OK, I'm doing it just uh, the way they do it in their, in their paper. But you can also write it in terms of J0. OK, it's this one. Let's, let's do a deal. Let's split the difference not being able to influence, influence future values of our respective surpluses. So this nasty looking math expression just says it's the argument that solves the maximization problem, the Nash maximization problem over little w. Right? Choose little w to split this map. And you get the first order conditions. Looks just like before. The ratio of beta to 1 minus beta is the ratio of the surpluses. So it's going to look like this. 
Now, this is interesting because, and this is very important, in the Nash bargain, you're always bargaining anytime something happens. When you start off, we both have the top of the productivity, x equals 1. And we're, we're grabbing the pen, we're about to sign the document. Okay, until we sign the document, we could both walk away from this. So the surplus we're splitting is different from the surplus we're splitting after we sign, the ink is dry, and the next instant a shock could occur. And if that shock occurs, the employer is in the hook for F if he wants to get rid of you. Before the, the ink was dry, before you signed, F was not in the table. See? So the work, it's called, it's a little bit like the hold-up problem. You kind of, this is where workers know they can, <laughs> they can screw their boss. You know, I, I'm such a nice employer, employee, and then you start working for them, and like two months later, you, you start acting up, and the guy wants to fire you, but it's too late because the, the ink is dry. So that's why there are two, effectively, there are two phases of this, this wage determination. The first one is at the very beginning of, of the contract, and then Epsilon seconds later, when the ink is dry, you're basically, as a worker, you have a one up on your employer because of this, this, this potential of a, of a severance um, that could arise. This, we call it T, the severance tax. Okay? So you can solve uh, under those two different regimes, the pre-dried ink regime and the post-dried ink regime. Right, so this is the wet ink regime, or the unsigned, re <laughs> unsigned document, and this is the post-signature. I think this is so cool, because this is really the way the world works. And these are risk-neutral people, and firms, and workers, and you still get this interesting result. So you'll have, you'll basically get a, a vacancy creation condition, which applies to the pre signing um, bargain, and then afterwards the job destruction will uh, apply to um, the post-signing condition. Okay, you'll get these slides and you can study them if you want, but the interesting thing is that um, everyone has to be rational in this model, so no, firms are not going to give away anything, workers are not going to give away anything, they're always going to take advantage of this. And I've heard stories about this, uh, I was talking to a guy who this is crazy. He works for a headhunter. He is a headhunter. He has his own company, and he had like 15 workers. He's above the 10 worker limit in Germany. So he basically said, look, I, I want to downsize, and uh, the workers were, you know, were facing unemployment. They went to the unemployment office, and the unemployment office says, look, if you don't sue your boss, you're not going to get unemployment insurance. You have to do this. So they were actually required by the, to take legal action. So you're creating all this automatic T here. Um, and that's just because if you have the right to do it, you, you should probably do it. <laughs> and that's the way people think in this world, right? And it's pretty rational. And it's unfortunately has some severe, severe implications. So you have two different wage equations. They look different. If you stare at them, you understand why. One is before the, the ink is dry, the other is before after the ink is dry. Okay. So we have the same diagram, except the, the conditions are much more complicated because they involve all these interventions. Training costs, firing costs, blah, blah, blah. Taxes. But you can do the same shifts and the same comparative statics as before. Yes? No, every instant of time that is accompanied by a shock. Because yeah. you don't have a shock every instant of time. Yeah, yeah. Right? There, there may be a long period of no shock. Yeah, yeah. And during that period, everything is the same. Mm -hmm. right. OK. So in the paper, Mortensen and Pissarides uh, go through various comparative statics results. So they actually they do the math for you. <laughs> I mean, literally, you have two equations in two unknowns, theta and uh, r, and you can solve for the endogenous variables as functions of changes in the tweaks in the exogenous parameters. So what happens if you raise s? 
Remember, S is the, the skill level. So you, not the S in the old model, but it's the skill level. What if you raise the arrival rate of shocks? What if you raise the unemployment benefit? What if you raise worker power? What if you raise the severance tax? So you can see that some, sometimes we have ambiguity. This makes sense. If you raise the, the firing tax, you make it less easy for workers to get fired, but you also increase the reluctance of firms to create vacancies and hire workers. And that's, if you, t if you talk to employers, they always say that. And a lot of people say, oh, that's just rhetoric. They're just trying to create. But you know, logically, it does make sense. And I think workers understand that. He's not going to touch me because he thinks I'm going to I'm not, I'm not going to be worth it for, for him. So that's the kind of ambiguity you have in this, in this mortensen pizzeridis model. It's a bit more exciting than the, than the vanilla version. So mortensen pizzeridis calibrated this model. They said, OK, what would the US look like? Put some US values into this model. And they're able to get a pretty decent unemployment rate. Looks like the US in the 1990s. Um, they also calibrated to Europe. The average EU country with higher, I mean, if you look at it, what's, what's, what's significant here? The most significant thing is the firing tax. In America, we have fire at will. So you work for me today, I get rid of you tomorrow, um, for better or for worse. In Denmark, they have that, but most European countries, they don't. In the UK, they do too, allegedly. Okay, Unemployment benefits are more generous in Europe on average. Some countries, it's much more generous. Some countries, not so much generous. So this is an average EU value. So you have to be careful. And they said, OK, let's see how it looks for high-skilled and low-skilled workers. That's cool, right? The high-skilled worker would be um, you know, um, high value of P. P is this shift parameter. And they look at the skills for European and American type labor markets. And they also calculate something called a first best, which I'm not really so convinced of. But it's like the very best setup um, in terms of maximizing output in the, in the economy. And K1 is the US and K2 is Europe? Yeah. Case, they have like a yeah. lower unemployment rate in Europe, even though right. the, the, the policies are much more different. Right, and that's because of this ambiguity, right? It's, uh, the ultimate question you should ask is how efficient is it? Because uh, unemployment can be low, but you may not be, matches may be so fragile, or sorry, so unfragile that you're employing a lot of workers very unproductively. That's the argument. So it's a great question. So stare at that. That's why this paper was very well received. You can also see that for low-skilled workers, the outcome is different, right? So you have higher unemployment. Um, and in, in the end, you have, um, so it's kind of, un, it's, in a sense, it's kind of unfair. I mean, and then I think they also had, a, there's some other things I could talk about, but take a look at it. And they also asked the question, what would happen? They also asked about an employment subsidy, which is the French solution. The French love subsidies, so they give, give money to workers, to firms, to hire workers, even though they have a high minimum wage, used to be much higher than, than Germany, um, but they haven't changed it much, so things are kind of evening out. And then um, high skilled, low skilled, employment subsidy and a hiring subsidy, they're not the same thing. One is you give mo money to matches in existence, and the other is you give people money for hiring. So you, it's almost, you know, have, the Germans talk about Mitnahme effect, so like what happens if you give somebody money for something they would have done anyway. That's kind of what you see in this, in this setup. Okay, and then you have, they have uh, taxes on, uh, on skill labor or uh, subsidies on low-skill labor, because that was discussed. It's discussed in France even today. You know, in France, they have a high youth unemployment rate. So how do you help youth? Well, one way is you might give, give the employer money to hire them. Okay, so, and they also, uh, they asked the question, which I want to finish with, what would happen if the French got the, U or the EU got the US rules and the US got the EU rules? And it's what you think. US unemployment would go up, EU unemployment would go, go down. Um, you know, duh, of course. <laughs> finish up with a criti criticism. So we'll, this is to lead into next week. Um, Maybe this Nash concept isn't right because wages aren't that flexible. We talked about that last time. It's still the same. 
Uh, you can also argue that the matching function itself is kind of a problem because everyone's treated equally in this matching function world, but actually you could think of there's a, the bathtub, if you've, if you, if last time you sat in the bathtub may have been many months ago or years ago, but when you sit in the bathtub, you notice there are some parts of the water that don't move very much, you know, maybe behind you, your back or uh, and where your feet are, the water's moving a lot. So you could think of in the bathtub of unemployment, some workers are getting lots of contacts and some workers are not getting many contacts. So maybe there's heterogeneity of, that we're not capturing here because we're treating everyone with, Everyone's treated the same with a matching function. This means that people who've just come into unemployment are more likely to get a match than people who have been in the unemployment pool for a long time. And that's something we have to think about. Um, no rejections. Okay, so in the, even in the Mortensen Pizzeries model, there's a, there's a critical value, but um, you won't have workers and firms in the bathtub coming together and saying, nah, uh, because everything is always at x equal one. That's they cooked it like that, and that's probably not realistic. I tried to argue that it doesn't matter much, but you might you might be mad. You know, you might might be crazy about that type of. And when you look at when you look at search, you do want to care about rejections. You do care about rejections. All right. So Morton's Pizzeri is useful. Sometimes the institutions are not clear cut, but that's the way life is. So severance, tax can actually reduce unemployment, we saw that, but it also may reduce GDP because the matches that survive are not the most productive ones. And maybe you wanna free up the, the human capital to go into some other lucky, it's all luck in this model, it's all luck. <laughs> we, have, we haven't got to the part where you have real skills, you, you know, differentiating. And you can learn a lot, okay? And I talked about these critiques. I think Thomas talked about them too, didn't he? Did he talk about the Scheimer critique, Hall critique, um, labor supplies oversimplified, but still it's a good, it's a good setup, you know? Um, even if firms hire more than one worker, um, you can still learn a lot from this model. If you want to improve it, you can have different types of jobs. You can do what um, Denhan and Ramey and Watson do. So you can assume that you, you could start, you could actually encounter someone and it's just a lousy match from the very beginning, but you still accept it. So you have to, the reservation property still applies. You can have endogenous participation. I have it on the paper that I did. We can have unions. We can actually put a union that unifies labor markets across skill types and many other things. Okay, so have a nice day. See you.